Good day, it's Harry Brook here, Ag Fieldman for Flagstaff County. And today we're talking to Dr. Brian Bears, who's the senior research scientist in agronomy in Lethbridge. And he's been doing a lot of interesting work on very early seeding wheat. You're listening to the official podcast of Flagstaff County. Could you maybe just tell me a little bit how it, how you started doing this sort of thing? <laughs> well, it's it's funny, and it's funny how sometimes these ideas arise. But um, I was I was just traveling to a meeting down at Montana State in Bozeman, um, driving from Lethbridge, and it was the end of March, and it was one of those years down here where you know, it was, you would think, you know, you could probably seed, but, you know, we've never really explored that a whole lot, but there were some farmers down there that they weren't seeding, but they were already prepping land because at the time they were still a little bit more on a wheat fallow system and so on. And, and that kind of gave me the idea, you know, if we can prep, why can't we seed? And if we can seed, what are the advantages and disadvantages and what's the risk benefit ratio to that? And so that was, that was kind of how it started. And when I got back, I, I was, I was certain that if we went that route, we would also need some different genetics to, okay. to make it work. And so I, I asked Rob Graff, our winter wheat breeder, and he happened just by coincidence to be working on you know, it basically winter wheats with a vernalization requirement removed. So they sort of are like spring wheats and, but mm -hmm. they theoretically should have more cold tolerance. So, so, so that's how we started. We were looking at the genetic aspect of comparing just a benchmark CWS variety like Stettler against these cold tolerant lines. And, and then, and then at that point it was like, okay, so what's the plan? What's the yeah. prescription plan here? So then you know, I thought, let's start at let's start at zero because anything earlier than that, the ground's probably going to be frozen anyway. And by zero, right. I mean recording that temperature in the top five centimeters or two inches. So as soon as as soon as you go out to your field and first register zero, that the other phrase we coined in this was it was the trigger. So yeah. the soil temperature trigger in which just commence with planting. And so we started at zero but somewhat assuming zero was going to be a risk. And yeah. then in two degree imp increments, we went out and planted these, these varieties and we did it. And this wasn't just a, you know, a Southern Alberta banana belt context here. We ran it all over um, Alberta and Saskatchewan as far North and, you know, Dawson Creek, BC. So oh, yeah. uh, we tested it all over and the results, the results were actually a little bit, surprising um mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways and and one was it was working so and even, by working, even with those varieties that are our standards like the stettler yeah and that was the surprise so two surprises was one almost everywhere exclusively you know provided you can mm -hmm. get in and in and do it right so yeah. there's obvious practical limitations if you're waterlogged or whatever but yeah. You know, when they, when Claire could go up in Dawson Creek and do it, as soon as he was out there to do it, what we observed was we always protected yield, um, always, and, and quite often going early at two degrees, you know, generally a lot of times improved it, but the, but the bigger advantage was that we really, really improved yield stability. So that means from year to year, field to field, more Despite the weather. results. Yeah. So wow. that was the big, and then the other one was the genetic side. Stetler did every, did just as well as, as these other lines. So we didn't so far with this project and we're on our, you know, third, fourth experiment. We haven't observed a real need for different genetics, which I think is a bit of an untapped area yet. So, so I think we could even enhance the system even more if we get going mm -hmm. with what are called some flex weeks building on what Rob did with, with the cold tolerance. So there's still an opportunity there, I think that we'll be exploring in the future, but, but 
you know, you know, to make a short story long, it, it worked and it worked everywhere. And now we're at a point where we've got producers all over Alberta and Saskatchewan trying it and coming back with success stories. And, and it's not, you know, it's not, it's not real clear cut. I think, yeah. I think there is some, there was a lot of angst with yeah. me and the growers that would phone me because it generally would go like this. It would be, you know, a farmer would call me and he would say, you know, I saw your presentation. I saw your data. I saw your study. And I think I can go. I'm at two degrees. And I was like, yeah, go. He's like, but nobody else is going. <laughs> Everybody just look for the timekeeper in the in the county, right? Yeah. So so we had a few brave early adopters that you know threw caution to the wind and went and tried it. And and at first they came back and said, you know, it looked like it went really good. I had really good field mm -hmm. conditions, good seed to soil contact, blah blah blah. But then about you know three weeks, maybe even less, I get my first phone call to update that. Oh God, there's we just got a big snowstorm. Uh, blah 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 and I'm like well let's just wait it out and see and then you know after that it would be well I got another phone call and it's like well it came through the snow fine I've got great crop stand but there's a forecast coming tomorrow for frost right and I was like god how much how many how many how much how much could go on this first year where we're trying to scale up we got snow and and you know Lethbridge had 30 yeah. days of below zero weather on our, on some of our treatments and you know the snow would mm -hmm. come it would melt it would freeze it would it would do everything ice over yeah yeah it would mother nature was trying to just you know throw every possible wrench into this which was a good thing we had frost events in may even wow. down in southern alberta that hit as cold as minus 11 and at that point i was like this it's is done. this is, it's yeah. done train wreck but the only damage those wheat plants, seedlings, and whatever had in that three leaf stage was a little bit of, you know, leaf burn on the on the top third of the leaf. And, wow. and all the all the guys that came back all said, best wheat crop I've ever had, best wheat crop in the community. And so so we, oh. you know, we didn't we didn't rush out there and get the cart ahead of the horse. We were pretty conservative in how we um you know, sort of framed our results and expectations. And I think what's happening now is is a bit of a success story on how it's being adopted because it, you know, I it's it's something that's really relevant, I think, to growers and something that they can adopt without without too much, you know, change to their system, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And the thing is, it does, it maximizes whatever moisture is in the snowfall that melts into the soil. It's using every little drop of that, which yeah. is a huge benefit, especially after a dry year like this last one. Yeah, and I think I think the other part to some of the success is that, you know, we incorporated those, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years and we've come mm -hmm. up with a lot of different practices. And so we've incorporated them also into the system. So it's high seeding rates, yeah. it's the use of seed treatments, dual fungicide, insecticide seed treatments, not not for the biotic factor, mm -hmm. but for that abiotic stress resistance that provides those plants. So those plants will hang in there with a lot more vigor and resist abiotic stress, those cold temperatures and so on with that neonic component and some of these fungicide uh, okay. components. So did, did you notice, part of it. did you do a test without seed treatment? No, because we had done all this work already in a you know, winter wheat yeah. system, knowing that you, you know we we sort of we sort of addressed that previously, and mm -hmm. and we we've done it in some other studies, but you know it's just we just adjourned that, knowing that if you want to do this, there's no way we would ever recommend without a seed treatment so because it's, don't it's shortchange it. Yeah. yeah, it's for sure buffering yourself from any possible risk from those cold soils and maybe even you know maybe even some of those frost events were were buffered um because of it um okay so so definitely we want high seeding rates we want that seed treatment and then it's just a prescriptive thing of going out and monitoring your field for soil temperature and mm -hmm. 
when you first record that, go try it. In fact, zero is probably not even that bad of a, a time to start either, provided that mm -hmm. the soil is loose enough and it's not frozen up right. at all. Because we had, we did have one site year and we used pretty aggressive openers where we ripped up a lot of aggregates with our zero degree. Uh, just because we had to go right it's yeah. it, zero it's part of the experiment so you go but one out of oh what are we up to now maybe 16 site years mm -hmm. was problematic every other those other 15 at zero were okay. fine you were saying high seeding rate and i was wondering what do you mean by high because when i think of high i think of like 30 plants per square foot 300 per square meter yeah and and so I kind of talk about it a little bit differently because, you know, we can't control plants. Right. All we can do is know that there's a threshold of a seeding rate of putting seeds down that we know will consistently reach that ideal threshold of, like you say, somewhere, somewhere there's a sweet spot of no less than 20 and, and probably no more than you know, 30, 35 plants per square foot. Mm -hmm. and so, to, so to consistently achieve that with the studies we've run, we know that you've got to be up around, you know, at a starting point with spring wheat, 46 mm -hmm. square foot. Um, okay. But we've also observed in high yielding varieties, uh, they will continue to respond positively to 45 seeds. And that, you know, and that the debate around seeding rate is... Mm -hmm has to extend beyond just the yield context because the one thing we know with seeding rates is you know you could seed as low as pot in a really good year you could seed mm -hmm. as low as say 30 seeds per square foot and and get the same yield out of 40 45 but there's but, more risk isn't there well there is because the the those intangibles with seeding rate are at a higher rate you've got way better crop uniformity so now mm -hmm. that means a lot of different things alone that means you've got better weed competitive ability yeah. you've got improved fungicide pesticide efficacy because everything's in the same stage because you've got more main stems out there now than tillers right and you've got an earlier harvest and a shorter overall crop and so those mean a lot to a farmer mm -hmm. but no study it's that's something very hard to to be able to demonstrate, show, reveal in, in field experimentation. It's more of an intangible that we just talk about. So it, so there's more to this than yield itself. And, and yeah. we also know, back to the comment about yield stability, you do improve yield stability with higher seeding rates, for sure. And that's so despite uh, changes in weather, as yeah, well, like droughts or... Yeah, so sometimes, you know, sometimes a seeding rate as low as 200, or 20 seeds per square foot compared to 400 or 40 may appear the same yield yeah. wise on a particular year. But if you go and do a yield stability, mm -hmm. and you, so you record that yield over years and fields, it's, it's light years different. That higher seeding rate will give you way more consistency with respect to performance yield and so on than a lower seeding rate. So, I'm kind of older, <laughs> and I do remember when, you know, our recommendations in the brown soil zone was for, well, you want to try and get, you know, 15 to 18 plants per square foot, because the whole fear there was that, well, if you seed it too thick, then there wouldn't be enough moisture to actually finish filling what plants there were. And you didn't find that in the survey, in the study, did you? No, in fact, Two of my very first experiments were the, the reason we ran it the way we did, the seeding rate factor within it, is because we were looking at soft fly infestations as well. Yeah. And we all know down south in the brown soil zone and down brown soil zone, when you have soft flies, you don't have a whole hell of a lot of moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to, to, to make it even more of a train wreck intentionally, I took and planted onto wheat stubble because we were wanting to plant into infested a field infested with soft fly. So, so it was, it was a terrible field condition when you think about 
all the things we preach about, you know, and, but, but we wanted to do that. Eventually, right. So you yeah. would think that in that scenario, in that context of, of lower water, probably compromise seed to soil contact that lowers better. Right. And yeah. that was just not what we observed. So we had, we had back in the day, it was AC Avonlea Durham. It was responding through four 45 seeds per square foot cdc go the highest cws at the time mm -hmm. same thing through 45 seeds per square foot and and i grew up on a farm dryland on my mom's side was dryland and the mm -hmm. talk always was like you say i i don't i can't convert it spatially but you know three quarters of a bushel to maybe you know, a little bit over a bushel maximum, right? And so now no we're one overdo way, it, yeah. Yeah, so we're way over double that recommendation now. But the back then it was like, and they, and they always talked about haying off, like haying <laughs> off. You don't see more than that, you idiot, because it'll hay off on you. And and I was like, I've never seen that before. And I observed it once with a rate we went with a super high rate of fifty. Mm -hmm. So at mm -hmm. fifty seeds per square foot in an extreme drought on a super sandy soil that 500 with a whole bunch of nitrogen as well because we had a nitrogen yeah. factor in there that one created a beautiful photosynthetic machine but it ended up barely being able to produce seed to one year so there's certainly a limit depending on yeah. your environment but you know the assumption you know that lowers better because tillering is my backup is is misguided it's faulty in other words so what about the fertility how do you basically feed for a, a how big a crop are you actually going for with the fertility with moisture being uncertain we would just do what a farmer did so we would in our in our case i've worked a fair bit with western ag innovations with that PRS probe that they use because I just find it very practical and easy to use. Mm -hmm. And I've known Eric Bremer, the Southern Alberta rep in contact on the research side of Western Egg for a long time. And he, you know, he, I've, I've, it's simple, it's easy to use. And we just take that and whatever prescription for N that Eric comes back with, we go forward with so far. Now, we, I, I was able to recruit a PhD student and Graham Collier has been working on oh, yeah. You might know Graham from New Farm. And, yeah. and so he took the concept that I developed and then he stacked on a couple of questions in relation to, of course, he's a, he's a, he's a herbicide guy. So he was right away interested in, um, you know, do, do enhanced efficiency fertilizers or, um, yeah alternatives to a pre-seed glyphosate application um, those were questions he had of course if you plant in mid-february like we have with this project when the soil temperature hits the trigger there's no green weeds out there so there's no, no point in doing glyphosate right so yeah. um, we've we've observed a fair bit of success with pyroxysulfone in some winter wheat studies addressing mm -hmm. downy brome and japanese brome and so we worked with that and that gave us some pretty good results as well. So um, on the fertility side, I think, I think there's a, there's still a bit of question about, and that's when I talked earlier about, you know, there's, you know, there's a, it's a bit of a paradigm shift in the sense that you've got this practice that works. And so now it's disrupted things on the farm a little bit because, you know, yeah. In, in some ways, it's good, though, because we know we've got some issues with glyphosate anyway. Now we're going to be able to, with this system, you know, come up with an alternative that will slow the evolution of weed resistance because we've, we've got to come up and use something else other than glyphosate for right. an ultra early system. We might decide that we wouldn't need to change our fertility practices. So what does that mean? Do we then start changing out? the sequence of, you know, a lot of guys, gals would plant peas first or, you know, yeah. now, now the wheat's gone in first. So what are the implications of that? And so I think that, you know, if we get the opportunity, those are the kind of things we'll build on in addition to, you know, does it work in Durham? 
does it yeah. work entirely? And so we've we've got an ongoing study right you now. You have to basically build the system, right? Yeah. Because it's it one thing, one factor affects everything else. Yeah, if, if you've got a true system, then the components, all of them need to be, you know, need to be reviewed. Tailored for it, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, we're at a point now where we're doing a lot of work on what we're calling a yield gap project, trying mm -hmm. to understand, you know, what the what is that gap on a farm between what's possible and what you're realizing basically is what that is. And, yeah. and we're, you know, part of part of what we're coming up with are sort of innovations that would help close that so that on farm nothing's getting cheaper so we don't yeah. want to really we don't want to add to that we really haven't added to that mm -hmm. but what we want to do is you know build up build a system that that maximizes return on what are now super expensive inputs yeah. and capital costs right yeah that's extremely interesting did you uh with with um the weeds did you notice any difference with these these high populations of uh, plants did it require less herbicide or it, were they just cleaner well there was definitely some advantage there uh graham's just in the process of finishing that manuscript so yeah uh we'll have a little bit of information that to, to that question sh shortly. I guess, yeah, the other thing I should have added earlier on too was there was this other question about, okay, you looked at Stepler, mm -hmm. so CWRS. So we're, we're assuming Stepler is representative of CWRS. So we were saying, right. but we, we were still limited to the context of it works for CWRS. And, mm -hmm. you know, not surprisingly, we're seeing really good cold resistance or cold tolerance which, you know, it's, I guess it's an artifact of the fact that we're already breeding north of the 49th parallel and further. Mm -hmm. So that adaptation was just sort of a, an artifact of, of where we are anyway. Just our regular um, selection. Yeah. Process. But we did, but Graham did take and look at, all, you know, most other wheat classes and we were observing the same thing. So if there's a grower out there in your area, it's like, well, I'm more of a CPS guy. What are the implications? Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing in in every market class of wheat, uh, other than Durham, we know where to work. And so far, even in Durham, it's looking good. So I guess the the acid test would be, to me, the guys that did it for you first. Have they stuck with it? They seem pretty committed. We always sort of, uh, you know, temper, you know, this the the promotion of this or the advocacy of it with, you know, it's, it's not going to work every year at every site per se, yeah. because your field conditions may not permit you to get out there when that right. temperature trigger hits. But I, I will say that so far, and we've been doing this since even ourselves, we've been doing this now since 2014, 15. I'm really surprised at how often it works. Um, all right so it's it's yeah it's it's been a really really revealing project in terms of what's possible on the seeding well, side i really like it because of the fact it kind of pushes the boundaries right and and sometimes we get so caught up in our own way we've always done things so it's it's interesting to see that you know there's better ways of using resources we have well, we have to, right? Like we've got a lot of pressure and I guess rightly so that we, you know, on the climate change platforms yeah. that are going to dictate how we, how we conduct ourselves. With there, fertility efficiencies, that sort of thing. Yeah. Like, and, you know, yeah. I just saw an ad for a combine, 917,000 or something. And so if those are the kind of costs that farmers are pressured with yeah. um, and wheat is an important component of that farming business mm -hmm. we you know we kind of <laughs> everybody in that wheat value chain better be committed to providing and trying to develop the most innovative practices related to their role that you know yeah. limit business risk and and 
and address those public good concerns as well. Right. And the fact that you improve stability of yield. I like yeah. that the term stability of yield. It's not saying highest yield, but it means the, the reduces the variability. Yeah, and I think, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future with where we go with mandates around mm -hmm. uh, carbon footprints and whatnot, but there's a lot of pressure on reducing nitrogen. And yeah. so if, if that's where we're going, which I think is misguided, I think we better quickly come up with some ways that, you know, allow us to, you know, protect yield, because if we can't protect yield, we're not going to protect the business of farming. Yeah, yeah the economics gonna are going to kill it. Yeah, not to mention, you know, you talk about yield stability. It's not just a, a, a you know, a, a Brian Barris thing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's something that's globally important because, you know, I'm part of this organization called the Weed Initiative, which, you know, was born out of a G20 Ag Ministers meeting where they're really concerned about food security at a global level. So we talk and we're starting to talk on the agronomy side there about, you know, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. yield's great. And yield helps a lot of your, you know, Pays grain the bills. And, and yeah, and like it, that part of it is clearly a driver. Yeah. But, you know, it, the volatility, it's not just an on-farm issue. It's a global issue. And we've got to try and get that volatility, you know, suppressed as much as possible with, mm -hmm. you know, without a big compromise to yield. And so if we can, if we can come up with things that incorporate integrate protection of yield you know stability of yield but also you know show the public that this is this is not this is not a big carbon emitter you know system this is a system that is actually quite climate friendly maybe that you know maybe 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 we're going to have to better promote or or fully assess what enhanced efficiency fertilizers offer there and how and what it even them. means really yeah exactly so did you um do any research using different forms of nitrogen or like using stabilizers that sort of stuff did it make any difference well we've sort of just touched on it with an ultra early seeding system so i think there's mm -hmm. work to be done there but we do have quite a large we've done a ton of work with that in winter week, yeah. and we've got a big big one going right now with CWS wheat funded by Alberta wheat, Alberta Innovates and um, Sask wheat. And that one here, here if you want to, <laughs> if you want to think about something counterintuitive okay. and this is preliminary, but it does sort of parallel some bigger uh, global studies. But so far what we see with the use of enhanced efficiency fertilizers in a spring wheat system, we're actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30 to 40%. And mm -hmm. 30 to 40% is what the government put as a target, I believe. So with, with one component, you could, you could meet their goals. <laughs> good. You know, and, 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 and coupled with no-till, coupled with other conservation farming practices or practices that also could help. I mean, we're, we need to talk more about that. And yeah. firstly, though, we're not seeing any advantage so far in winter wheat. And I'm, I'm, I'm honestly a bit puzzled a bit by that. I suppose, you know, you've got a bigger photosynthetic machine you're trying to feed. You've got it out there way longer in a vegetative state. Mm -hmm. you know? So maybe the current design of enhanced efficiency fertilizers isn't allowing you know the same sort of greenhouse gas reduction that we're seeing in spring wheat i don't know okay so have i missed anything i'm sure i have but uh with in the so that you were saying with the soft lie it it prevented huge losses with your seeding any other in insects that you dealt with or looked at no not really and i think we might be circling back to 
wheat stem sawfly just on account of what we're seeing. It's interesting, you know, Montana hasn't really hasn't really observed much of a reduction in sawfly pressure mm -hmm. over the years. And and but we we kind of I, I think by our by our virtue of our cropping diversity up here versus down there, we were able to see it. Yeah, it built up, but then it died off and it stayed died off probably until the last couple of years. One of the yeah. one of the people working with, with my tech team, they farm out by foremost and it's starting to blow up a bit there um, and elsewhere. And so is this a blip or do we have something we need to go circle back to and, and take a look at? Because, you know, just as just as the way things work and in life i mean when i first started my research program it it blew up big time and yeah. so i ended up doing a whole phd on it developing an ipm system for wheat stem softly and i think now we may have to circle back to that thesis and see what components we can build on or exploit a little bit more because it could be coming well it does seem to go in cycles if anybody wanted some more information on this, could they contact you? Yeah, for sure. We've got a lot of resources um, online. There's been quite a few various things related to it. Even I think even a YouTube video by Real Agriculture is out there. Okay. Um, certainly, if one just Google's my name, I'm sure they'll they'll track me down. And and um, yeah, I would just. I guess I guess the one thing we're still trying to assess with it is, you know, by moving it into an ultra early system, does mm -hmm. CWRS really mimic the benefits you get from winter wheat? And that's one thing we're sort of still sorting out. And yeah. and the one last question that I get a lot of was, okay, this is working great with this prescriptive thing starting at zero or two. What if I just said to hell with that and plant it in October as a dormant seeded strategy instead? Okay. And, and my answer to that's always been because I've done a ton of work in winter wheat agronomy was, well, if you want to go that early, why the hell don't you just try winter wheat? Um, it might be a lot <laughs> less risky. So I, I, stuck, I stood by that answer for as long as I could until Kent Sarita out of Rolling Hills and uh, Russ Stewart from ProMax Agronomy decided they were, they were, they were going to go ahead and do some dormant seed at Durham. So oh, yeah. we went back a little bit back and forth um, because with our current Durham, we do have a dormant seeded treatment as well. And so mm -hmm. Kent went in and planted a circle of Durham. And I, I think he was a little bit, we did, it was about the same time. He may have been a week earlier in mid-November. I told him wait till mid-November. And then uh -huh. I went in with my tech team. We planted in late, in like around the 24th of November. And, and, and just to be very clear about this, we don't know if this is going to be an effective strategy, but it's been asked enough from us that I think we sort of owe it to the growers out there that are funding the research to, to take a look and see and give them a good, honest risk assessment based on, you know, a hypothesis driven. Yeah. Experiment. And so, so we're defining dormant seeding as anything planted between November and January. So if you plant it November to January, it's considered yeah. dormant. And so what are the implications of that? What are the risks? What are the benefits? And there's been work done in Ontario by Bill Dean, where they actually showed it was quite effective. But in their mm -hmm. case, what they were doing actually is waiting until the soil froze right up and then just sort of skimming in on the surface frost seeding uh -huh. um, it was it was tight enough that they didn't sink in so they just sort of skimmed it in on the surface with disc openers whereas you know that's not that's not the context out here like kent went in if you get a picture on twitter and it looked beautiful it looked like mm -hmm. it was spring seeding situation the soil was beautiful you could tell he got really good seed to soil contact yeah and we had the same experience we a heavy snowstorm hit we waited for it to clear out, and by the 24th of November, we were good to go and um, got it in. Our colleagues in Swift Current got it in just as that snowstorm was starting, 
and uh, there's some great pictures on Twitter. So, you know, we'll see. We'll what we're trying to do is assume the risk for the growers first, so that right. you know we can come back and give an honest opinion that's based on science about whether or not to adopt that strategy. But right now, the prescriptive strategy of ultra early seeding is is locked in, and it's a it's a good strategy. And it's working. Yeah, definitely working. Okay, I was just thinking of the time they tried using dormant seeding canola. It oh, was, yeah. That didn't work so good. Yeah, and I don't, you know, and I think anecdotally out here, at best, the results are mixed for yeah. dormant seeded wheat. But, you know, a lot's changed in 20 years. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, I think it was time to take a look at it. Um, I'm not particularly convinced it's going to be better than the ultra early seeding system but you know who knows mm -hmm. maybe maybe it's one more practice we integrate into that that theme or that concept of ultra early i don't know we'll see or maybe in that situation that's when these genetics become more important so yeah lots of questions it's 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 a really really fulfilling project right now it's keeping us mm -hmm. out of trouble for sure. Well, it's got lots of valuable information being generated, and it's always good to have more options open to you, I think, when it comes to agriculture on the prairies. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate this. Is there any last words you'd like to leave us? Any nuggets of wisdom? I think the tank's empty. But, <laughs> uh, obviously, if something is something, uh, you know, spawn uh, question um i'm always here to answer so well thank you very much i really appreciate this yeah no problem harry thanks, thanks. For the